hello everybody. So I'm both an artist and a software developer, and uh, basically that means my week is split pretty equally between my art practice and uh, currently my role as a lead developer for a medical application. Um, but my work as a software developer greatly influences how my artistic practice comes along, and it's something that will be part of this uh, talk. Uh, can you see this out here now? Yeah. Okay. So, it's pretty risky to give your whole talk as a live demonstration. It's even more risky if you do it over a remote desktop connection. So, <laughs> fingers crossed. Uh, but yeah, I write... Uh, uh, this talk is about uh, an application I've been working on for the past five years, which uses... Um, it's volumetric sculpting. So basically what you know if you're in data science, like a three-dimensional array of numbers, but uh, I work with it in a sculptural manner. So uh, changing and adapting um, these uh, volumes in a way um, that's different than when you're used to. But, and uh, yeah, and when I do that, I'm, I'm using a lot of the dynamic aspects of Python. So one thing I'm gonna be speaking about in this talk is how, <coughs> how I leverage Python's dynamic nature uh, and maybe you can take some of those things with you uh, as well. But first, I'm going to show something different. So, this is a trajectory of a bullet through water. And I show this because a lot of times when you hear people talking about art in tech conferences, it's always about generative art, something that you generate. But most often, it's used as a tool, just like in any other industry, to solve a specific problem. And you might under, like ask, like, why do you want to, or do, why do you need to plot the trajectory of a bullet through water um, for art. So this is one of my recent projects from 2017. It's called The Joy of Escape. It's, it's a sculpture of 2,000 liters of water where the viewer is invited to stand in front of a bullet that stops in front of their heart. And uh, essentially, I needed to figure out like how big do I build the tank? Uh, so I went into a collaboration with a physicist who made the algorithm for me, which I could then just plot out the trajectory. And I think like cases like these are the most like understated uses in art. Like it's not always obvious that code was used as part of making this work, but uh, yeah, that's uh, many things are like that. <coughs> to continue, this is another work. Uh, it's from a series called Structure and Opposition. It's from an exploration around complexity, where I use chest as a way to generate visual complexity. Um, from my exploration, I found that structure and opposition were the two necessary components for complexity to, to arise. And to explore it in a visual manner, um, I used chest as a generative motor. But I started doing it by hand and then working with it a lot. Like you kind of like, okay, I want to try hundreds of games and I want to try different openings and different eras, see how that evolves visually. And then, like, you, you want to automate it. So that's another part where, like, generative art can be used often, like, as a way to automate the search area or the number of the, the search space. So you can later do make that selection as, as the creator. A uh, third way of using software and art, which is kind of, like, not mentioned as often either, is just, like, as assistive. So this project uses, um, it's a precursor to the software I'll be showing today, and it uses a medical software to visualize these volumetric data, but you just use it in a different way than it's intended to. So this is the software that's written to, for basically for medical researchers to analyze and segment uh, computer tomography or any tomography kind of scan, which is like a three-dimensional volume of data. Uh, I adapted it and I use it in a different way. I think I wrote a plugin here to change the light a little bit, but uh, but in general, it's repurposing something for something it's not maybe used for, like taking out the clothes in a kind of scan like this, where usually the doctors would just be looking at the bones or a specific area of the body. So that's like a different area where like having knowledge of adapting software a little bit is a great help as as an artist. But let's get back here, and I'm going to talk. So all of these, everything you see on the screen, um, the top part, you see a few commands that are run within my software. Uh, 
which I call volume. Um, and I did that as kind of a way to show a little bit of the internals of the program, how it works. Um, and this slide basically wants to summarize everything that I've been talking about, that there's these three different areas of using code in art. There's specific, there's a generative or assistive. And often like they all, sometimes they're, they cross lines and they're not always like super delimited, but, uh, but in general, like that's a little bit what I wanted to say with, with this part of the talk. But before I go on to speak more about the software in itself, um, so as you can see, this is like something that's being continuously rendered. Um, it's being rendered with something called volumetric rendering or volume rendering. And what volume rendering is, is that it's different from surface rendering. So what you're used to in normal 3D is uh, points in space, lines between them and planes. And that renders what, what you see on the screen, essentially. Volume rendering is a continuous data set of scalars, so numbers, uh, which it use, you use to visualize it. A uh, rendering technique most common is called volumetric ray casting. It's different from ray tracing. And it's called, it's an image order technique where a ray is shot from every pixel in the image. It's just sampled as it goes through the volume. And then those samples are passed through a ray function. That ray function can vary a bit. So in medical settings, sometimes you want like maximum or minimum intensity. But I use the most common like visually attractive technique, which is a composite technique where you get the most, uh, it looks mostly like a real shape, basically. These scalar values in the volume, um, are also like passed through like a mapping function because how these images are built up, what you see here is actually both. So here what I've done to illustrate the difference between um, surface rendering and volume rendering is I've divided this, the volume up into segments. And if we go in here, we can see what you see in the middle is a wireframe representation of a surface rendering. But all of the segments that you see uh, on top of that is volume rendering. And they act very distinctively. And the reason it interests me as an artist is because of the visual artifacts and the visual representation that comes from this, this kind of rendering that you see a lot of different kinds of like specifically in the medical field. Uh, but it hasn't been explored that much like aesthetically or, vis uh, or visually. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to create this software to be able to play with it in my, my in my way and get to know it better. Uh, so let's go back here. Yeah, basically that's it um, for that part. So like why why do I need to create my own software? There exist excellent tools already for exploring volumetric imaging. Uh, Slicer 3D is one, which is excellent. It's used by a lot of medical researchers. Paraview is another. They both use an underlying toolkit called the Visualization Toolkit, and both support plugins. So like, why do I need to create my completely own software? And I think it's the reason, the main reason was like none of them are really adapted to changing these scans, because the doctors don't have a reason to really like just place, like recompose everything in a medical scan. There's no real reason to do that. You can do it, and there is segmentation and stuff like that, but it also has to do with like peeling back layers of abstraction. So when you get closer to what you're working with, you feel that you can control the realm better, and you feel a higher degree of liberty in your creative exploration. And I think like that's the key component to, to making it from yourself. And if you look at the visualization toolkit library, I mean, the class hierarchies are really huge. So an application layer on top of that, if you're going to like develop on top of that, it becomes too complicated to work with. So for me, in my case, it was easier learning visualization toolkit and building only what I needed on top of that to make my kind of own, my own software. Um, so why, why, why did I use Python? Well, basically because the VTK has Python bindings and uh, it's fast. Uh, doesn't matter, it wouldn't run differently in, if I wrote it in C++ or in Python. And another big reason is that it's the whole ecosystem and the primarily the scientific ecosystem of libraries uh, in Python are very useful. So 
the one thing I do differently from VTK in normal is that I use NumPy arrays instead of their underlying data structure uh, for the volumes because it allows me to pass like a part of the volume or the whole volume through like a scientific imaging library or something like that if I want to blur, if I want to extract some features. So that's also one way like that Python is really useful and helpful specifically for that community and, and ecosystem that <coughs> helps artistic as well as like uh, research exploration. So, in that way, it's very um, um, thankful to 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 have that at hand. Um, so, core libraries. I mentioned some of the core libraries here. One is uh, VTK, of course. This is all built around PyQt. So, one thing you'll see here if I do. So, when I work with this. I, I built all this around PyQt so that I can control things because it's different sometimes when you're working like in a creative headspace and a coding headspace. Sometimes they align, but sometimes they don't. And you want like user interface in order to be control what you're doing. It could be changing lights, it could be adapting certain parameters, or maybe you just had two beers and it's easier to touch things than <laughs> than to uh, than to write the code. But I don't know. In my mind, it's interesting how they both converge, and I try to like embrace a way of thinking creatively with the code I'm using and interfacing with the software through the shell. So, what you saw here to the left before is actually uh, is actually an IPython console, and I think this is like the main thing that really helped me develop this because. It's running in what, if you read the documentation for Qt consoles, there are different ways of running a, an IPython console inside your software. And the third one is like in process, in kernel process. And it basically says like, don't do this. Uh, but it works really well because you get direct access to your whole application that's running. So you can basically, uh, so the scene here, for example, if we look at, The scene is basically uh, a scene, and the, all the objects in my software are all built around this node object, and they're also like Qt objects. You can get direct access to everything that you're using. So if you want to change the user interface, uh, if I want to check, like, try a different a function on a volume directly from the shell, it's, it's very helpful. So that would be if you develop anything like similar to this. And it's also probably the reasons I started doing it, the whole thing by myself, is that I wanted that shell access. Like, if you've worked with the Django shell, you know how useful it is to, like, I need to jump in here. I have all of the modules already loaded in here. I can just change something. I wanted a little bit of the same kind of interface to, to my software. Um, Yeah, so I was getting in already to these dynamic uh, design patterns, and I think that generally that, that they have what they are what have allowed me to kind of work creatively with a software that's so complex. Because if I wrote this in C++, I mean I've changed the module architecture two or three times, and it's a lot of work. Like changing the module architecture in PyQt in C++ would have taken me weeks, but here I can do it in a couple of days. And uh, I think that like liberty of refactoring quickly is is truly what like it's cheaper for me to buy com like really expensive com not really expensive but like this is running on my desktop at home it could probably run on a newer Mac it's just that if you want something that moves really quickly it doesn't matter if it's written in C++ or in Python because the actual rendering engine is still running in C in the background so and I haven't noticed any slowdowns by writing it in Python. Uh, the only time you do need to do some profiling and stuff is when you do, uh, is when you're working with um, with animation. So the whole animation callback system that's running is actually also written in Python, and there I did have to do some profiling to see like, okay, this is like being called too many times a re-render, or you're bundled the render cycles if you're doing like changing many parameters on the same object. But if you do that, it works fine. So, so I have no regrets whatsoever. I'm really happy having chosen Python for it. And I mean, I guess many of you know it already, but one of the easiest tips to work dynamically with the, with the shell is the load external auto reload too, which basically like if you input a library and then you change the code outside, 
then it'll be updated automatically in the shell, so you don't have to re-import it. And that's something like, I usually, when I work in my studio, I have like one side of the screen is the software running, and the other is all the source code. So I'm constantly changing both all the time. And that's like, that's also like what's really hard to do with other, in other platforms and other languages, but it's really helpful, specifically like if you don't really know where you're going or you want to try things out. So uh, the last part of this talk, because I've kind of like showed you my slides, so to speak, um, I'm going to So what I spoke about before were these scalar values. And here you see I have something called, I don't know if you can read it, it says scalar opacity here. So since this is like basically like a big stack of 2D images, they're all in grayscale, the way you control how it's seen is basically by controlling the scalar values. So if, for example, you only want to see the bones and the bones like you, you've probably seen a CT scan sometime, you know that the bones are in white, and white is because they have higher density. So if you want to see only the bones, you can adjust that to see only the bones, for example. And then you play with these, and like it goes all the one down to air, so you gotta like watch out for that, but then usually you put something around here. Um, and then you usually play with the light, for example. And also the color, these colors, is also the mapping of the scalar values. So if I change a node here, for example, to be red, all of the values that fall within that red area or that, that scalar range get colored in a certain color. So that's kind of like what I play around with a lot. Um, but I was going to show you, like, mainly the one thing that I think, like, has adapted my way of working and what you're forced to do when you're working with something so complicated as these 3D volumes is like you get this constraint like I don't really know how to figure out this like dividing some I can't carve it like I have a knife and you have clay so you imply different constraints and these constraints are maybe what makes it interesting in the expression later and the way I've applied the constraints is basically I work with this grid um see so i have this grid which i work with and then i basically and i mean if you're a developer you also implement the vim keys to control the grid <laughs> but it's like 3d vim uh and I, I guess this is like another way where like what you're working on so you 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 play around with like the shapes and I play around a lot with the grids and because it's so like the grid is so simple it forces you to think about other kind of aspects like proportions and this like simple conception of like it forces you to minimize your aesthetical space, which I think a lot of times is, is positive in, in the way you work. Um, transitions are basically another thing I didn't really cover here, but something that like when you write software for yourself, you can put the configuration in the code and you can make like the user interface auto generate depending on the attributes you put in your class hierarchy. So for example, a light, I have an attribute in the light called azimuth and a class variable called azimuth. And when I load up the the software, it checks, like, is there any azimuth in the layout file for Qt? Well, there is, then they connect it together. And you can, like, facilitate these things because you are the only one using the software. It allows you to be, like, very promiscuous in how, how you do things with, with it, which is thankful. Um, and I think, like, uh, yeah, it's something I wanted to mention in general like that. Uh, but the same way that that works is with, for example, with these uh, transitions, which are basically just, it's a transition library or um, functionality which are just tied into specific attributes. So I have certain preset attributes, but I could link any attribute in a light or a volume or to be transitioned between two values. So it's a little bit like the Python thing, like we're all adults here. You don't have to limit what you can and can't do. You don't set any max 
values of like there is no max light. Sometimes it just overshoots and you get like bit flickering or something like this. But you like this because it's nice creatively to not impose like limits on yourself. Um, yeah, I think like in general that were the parts that I wanted to cover a little bit here. Uh, I was a little bit nervous in the beginning of the talk, but I feel much better now. So I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's actually my brother. Uh, so uh, yeah, maybe I should. Like, I work for a medical company that also deals with X-ray, but it's very sensitive that thing. So obviously, I don't take anything from them. Uh, there are research databases where anonymized this subject is called in the medical field. Uh, but I also have a brother who has like a medical record that competes with the Bible. So <laughs> that's my main source of content, actually. <laughs> yeah. May I? Uh, so my name is Slavik. We're from PyCon here. And uh, we work a little bit with um, in CFD as well with um, VDK and stuff. Uh. And, and um, so as far as I understand, you only use OpenGL rendering. Is that correct? Uh, so the rendering engine uh, in VTK, um, it depends a little bit on what computer I'm using. Uh, but there is one now, it's called something like, just pass, pick the best GPU one on my system, and I use that one. Ah, OK, because, because they, uh, I'm not sure uh, if for volume rendering, but for surface, for sure, Intel is developing now a brand new OSP Ray. I know, yeah, yeah. It's but it's CPU-based, no? I think it's CPU-based. It's yes. for doing like really intensive, uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. But well, in our application, it worked and it showed nice results, maybe. Yeah, I, I have. This is on a, running on a GTX 1080 on my desktop at home, uh, or in my studio. And uh, I ca I don't need that if I if I wanted to work with it still, but I need it if I wanted to move because then I can get like a decent frame rate. And that's why I do it on remote desktop here, basically. Hi, um, hey. it was a really nice talk. I, I was wondering, you said that you were doing, um, uh, using some of both scientific data and, and through the ray tracing, you could run it through a function or, or so. Yeah. Uh, have you experimented with um, more realistic opacities and, uh, and uh, like optical depth, uh, for example, to, to, to really produce a, a true rendering throughout, throughout, throughout the material. A more lifelike, you mean? For example, or experiment with different opacities, yeah. different materials. So I don't know, it doesn't have to be lifelike, I guess. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I have. And um, so this work, I've been working on it for a long time. It's kind of matured to a point now where for the spring, I'll be having an exhibition. And one thing I didn't mention also is that um, so I also work with this as physical sculptures now. And what you have to do when you go from volume rendering to like a physical sculpture is you have to run like a marching cubes algorithm over it that kind of like converts it back to a surface volume that you can then 3D print to later cast or do whatever you want. But um, I have like I experimented a lot with different expressions and stuff. I didn't want to make this talk so much about the different results because some are not always done. I wanted to make it. Uh, and uh, but um, I showed my email or my I can write like this. You can just look at my my I have my um, so that's my email and also my website. So if anybody is interesting, just email me and I'll send you like my invoice. Uh, but I'm aiming to have an uh, exhibition sometime in the spring this year. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.